All right, let's turn in our Bibles to two places. First Chronicles chapter 19, and we'll be looking at verse 13. First Chronicles chapter 19, verse 13. And then the other place I want you to turn, and just stick your finger in that place, that's Ephesians chapter 6. So um, we'll start in First Chronicles chapter 19. And verse 13, but then we're going to spend a little bit of time over in Ephesians chapter 6. So go ahead and make your way uh, over there as well. Uh, if you're new with us as a church, we've been reading the Bible a chapter a day and just making our way uh, through uh, the Bible, reading it a chapter a day. And then on Saturday nights, I've been taking one you know, verse or one passage or one chapter out of those seven that we read the, the preceding week and doing the Bible study on it, which is what I'm going to do uh, tonight. And as a pastor, I just want to encourage you, I, I want to encourage you, get in that habit of reading the Bible every day. It's good for you. And if you call Calvary home tomorrow, we'll be reading First Chronicles chapter 25. And I want to encourage you to join us. Uh, by next Saturday, we'll have finished First Chronicles and we'll be two chapters into Second Chronicles. And we're just going to keep uh, trucking through the Bible. Let's pray and then we'll dig into our study for tonight. Heavenly Father, we love you. We're grateful to be a part of your kingdom. We're grateful to have tasted your love and to have received your grace. And we're grateful, Lord, that somebody loved us enough to tell us the truth about you and about us and about life. Father, as we're here tonight with your word open up in front of us, help us. Come by your spirit right now, Lord, and open up the eyes of our understanding. Help us to see what we need to see, hear what we need to hear. And Lord, let us be changed to be more like Jesus Christ. We're counting on you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. First Chronicles chapter 19, verse 13, we read, be strong and let us use our strength for our people and for the cities of our God and may the Lord do what seems good to him. Be strong. Keep your finger in First Chronicles. Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter six, verse 10, says something very similar. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He says almost the same thing. Be strong. Be strong. Be strong. Now, for us in North America, we understand the words and we do have a little bit of the sentiment that's behind them. But, let's just be frank, we live in a culture of peace. Like, it's not everybody that has the privilege of seeing a fist fight every day. It's not many people that live that way. In fact, when we see a fist fight break out, it's, it's strange. It's rare. And, and for many of us, it's traumatic. You know, the fight, what happened? like, come on, what's wrong with you? How come we couldn't talk this out? You know, kind of thing. So we don't really have that mentality of a fight. However, when P.K. Subban came over and slashed Mark Stone, everybody that was watching that game in Ottawa and was a Senators fan only had one thing on their mind. Be strong. <laughs> You know, it, it was, well, we got to get that guy back. I mean, it, you, this is a fight. It, 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 if you're into hockey, this, this is really the only place that I know of in our culture where it's expected that there's going to be a fight, and it's going to be a good fight, and we're rooting sometimes for a fight, and sometimes people go to the game just to get into a fight, you know, uh, kind of thing, but it's really the only place that it is. Outside of that, this is really a strange concept for us that somebody would need to be strong. Most of us, a lot of us, never been in a fight. 
Some, uh, a lot of us have never been in the military, never seen combat, don't know what that is to, to take courage, to be strong. It was Mike Tyson that said, everybody's got a great strategy till they get hit in the mouth. <laughs> it's just something that happens when, when, when there's a fight. And you need to be strong. You need to take courage. And this is what is being said here. Listen, be strong. Now, I realize that there might be, I don't know, one or two people here that didn't read the story in First Chronicles, so they don't understand what the context is of these words, be strong, and let us use our strength for, you know, the people of our cities, and, you know, and let's fight and let the Lord do what he seems best. And so, you know, our thought automatically is it's the Bible, they're into fighting, there's a war, here we go. Well, let me give you the context, because you might think that this was a fight that, you know, they deserved, or that they were asking for or that they provoked. Nothing could be further from the truth. Actually, what happened was the Israeli army is surrounded on both sides. On one side of them, they have the Ammonites that want to hurt them. And on the other side of them, they have the much larger and much more skilled Syrian army. And they're in the middle. They're about to get sandwiched. They're about to get crushed. This is the context. You say, well, what did they do? What did they do to start this fight? Well, when you read the chapter, you find out King David sent a handful of guys over to the neighboring country of Ammon, and they were sent to bring words of kindness and uh, um, condolence to the brand new king of Ammon. His name was uh, Hunan. Because his father, Nash, Nahash, had just passed away. And his dad had been really kind to David. And so David said, I'm going to show kindness to his son. He's a brand new king. I, I'm going to go over and say, man, we're sorry that your father passed away. And he was a good man to us. And we want you to know that uh, we liked him. And then we should, you know, it's good. But Hunan got some bad advice and He thought it would be a great idea. Well, actually, what he thought was is that uh, David had sent the guys over to spy out his land so he could attack them. And so, how dare he send these guys over? Well, we're going to take care of it. Shave the guys' beards off. Cut their garments off at the hip. He humiliated them and then sent them back. And then he realized, Hunan, then he realized... Oh, we totally misread that one. We totally misjudged that one. That was a huge mistake. We're talking about King David here. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And the smart thing to do would have been to apologize. But he didn't do that. He figured, oh man, you know, they're going to come and attack us and we got to get ready. And so he gets his army together. And not just that, he goes and hires all the Syrians to come over and help him. And another king on another side, come over, come over and help us. I'm pretty sure David's going to attack us. We got to attack him first. And so this massive groups of armies are uh, amassing on the border of Israel. Obviously, David's going to hear about that. And he sends Joab, his general, with his army out there to protect the border. And they end up in the middle of these two armies that are going to squish them. They didn't pick the fight. They didn't start the fight. They didn't even provoke the fight. The moron was paranoid. (laughs) And he just kept making bad decision after bad decision after bad decision, and it was going to result in innocent women and children getting killed. And so it was their job to stand there and to protect and to defend Israel. So that's what they were doing in the middle of these two armies. And Joab, the general, seeing the situation, says to his brother Abishai, hey, tell you what. I'll take the larger and the more skilled army on. You take the Ammonites on. And if, it, if they're too strong for you, I'll help you. And if these guys are too strong for me, you come over and help me. But basically, we're going to be back to back. We're going to fight. And then he says, but be strong and let us use our strength for our cities and our people and let the Lord do what seems best to him. You see, Andy, what in the world is the parallel to us? Well, you may not know this, This may come as a surprise to you, but we're in a fight. We're in a fight. 
We have an enemy. And this is why the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter six says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He says, listen, you need to be strong. See, Andy, I don't understand. What, what, what's the deal? Well, here's the deal. A few years ago, one of the guys that used to come to Calvary, he, uh, he doesn't come anymore, he moved away, but he, he had some massive problems. And uh, he, uh, you know, just really ruined his life through alcohol, through drugs, through gambling, and through sex, and he also had some mental health problems. And uh, he ended up over there at Jericho, received Jesus Christ, and man, started to get, for the first time in his life, victory over all of his problems, over all of his issues. And I will never forget this as long as I live. He had this bewildered look in his face and he said to me, he goes, Andy, I don't get it. I thought my family would be happy for me because I finally got control of all my issues, but they're all more mad at me now because I'm a Christian. What's going on? What happened? I said, well, dude, you just switched sides. That's what happened. You're on the other team now. It's not just people that are new believers, though. Some of us grew up in the church, grew up in the church, now becoming adults, now starting to figure things out for ourselves, and now looking back, looking back on our childhood, and man, there were some good things that happened, there were some great things that happened, there were some things that the Lord did, but man, you know, there's just this confusion that sometimes sets in with some of us because there wasn't some good things in there sometimes. And so sometimes we're sorting out, man, what do I do with that guy? And what do I do with this relationship? And what do I do with my family? I mean, these people are all supposed to be Christians. They're all supposed to have the truth. They're all supposed to know the truth. And yet they act like this. And man, and some people I've talked to are just so confused. They're like, what's going on? I've lost track of the conversations I've had around temptation. Pastor Andy, what do I do? Here's what's going on. And, and sometimes, sometimes when you talk to the people, the situation is so dire that they're almost in tears, they're almost in tears. Some of them have cried and they said, I don't know what to do to make this stop. Is there anything that it can be done to make the, the temptation stop? Because I have no power over it. And then there's something that we don't talk about at all in North America, and certainly not in the church, and that is some unexplained metaphysical stuff. Some people have had that horrible experience of waking up in the middle of the night, and there is something or someone invisible on them, choking them. And they're like, man, this is not my imagination. Like something is going on here. Or worse yet, being groped. They're like, man, you know, I can't see it. I can't put my finger up. There's something or someone invisible is doing something. Coming and making their presence known in the room. Bumps in the night. Doors slamming, things being creaking around. And then, you know, just like, well, well what, what's up with that? And some people traumatized, just traumatized by that stuff. Listen, we're in a fight. And God's word to us is be strong. Be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Listen, I realize tonight that there are some of us here that are in a desperate situation. We don't feel like Joab, general of an Israeli army, encouraging anybody. We don't even feel like Abishai, 
you know, like being encouraged. We feel a little bit more like that dude that the good Samaritan picked up off the side of the road that had been whooped up on and left for dead. We feel more like that. And we're saying, come on, man, what are you talking about? Be strong. I can't do nothing. Listen, you need to hear the scriptures. The encouragement from the sacred scriptures, the word of God to us tonight is be strong. Be strong. Let's leave 1 Chronicles. And let's look what being strong looks like for the New Testament believer in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter six, we'll start in verse 10. We'll just go through it real quickly. I wish we could spend way more time on it, but we're just gonna give that little boost. You know, Job got, Job got, you know, he gave Abishai two or three sentences. Be strong. Let's use our strength. Let's trust the Lord. Let him do what's right. You know, he got the two or three sentences out. We're going to get a few more than two or three sentences. We'll, we'll get you a little bit more, but um, we'll give it just a little primary here. Here's the key. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Here he starts out. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Oh, there's the key right there. That's the help right there. You say, oh, come on. How do you, how do you become strong in the Lord? How do you become strong in the Lord? Paul, same guy writing this in Ephesians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Might want to mark that down somewhere. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Go back and reread that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He glory. He says, I glory in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and calamities. Why? Because the power of God rests on me. God's grace is found in those weaknesses. You say, what does that look like? Here it is. First of all, it would be identifying them. (laughs) It would be not ignoring them. Listen, if you've got a weakness to chocolate-covered almonds, don't cover it up. Share it. Tell people. Let people know that you got a problem with chocolate-covered almonds. You say, well, Andy, I, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm weak in that area. I, I don't want people to think weird things about me. I, I don't want them to bring chocolate-covered almonds over just to watch me squirm. I, 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 you know, they'll, they'll, they'll think I'm not that good of a Christian. You know, they'll think, you know, they're going to talk about me and, and they might treat me different. Listen, all of those reasons at the root of them is pride. And God gives grace to the humble. Got to be humble. Josh said the same thing a couple of weeks ago when he was talking about pornography. It's the same thing. If you're willing to let go of your pride, you'll start winning. But you got to share it. You got to glory in that weakness. You got to make that known. You got to identify that. You got to share it. I had a little conversation recently, a couple of guys wanting to get some victory in that area of sexual purity. So they had their strategy and plan, you know, that kind of thing. I said, hey, let's listen. And I, and I said, listen, 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 you want to get victory in this area. Here's what you need to do. You need to tell your mom or your grandma or your sister what you're struggling with. <gasps> yeah. And then show them the pictures. <gasps> yeah. You want victory or not? I mean, like, come on. You're only going to do that once. You do it twice, you're an idiot. I mean, you like, you only do that once. Why? Because you don't want to have that conversation with your mom or your grandma or your sister or your wife. You don't want to have that conversation. Guess what? You're going to get victory. You're going to be sitting there thinking, well, if I do this, then I'm going to have to, sh- oh man, oh man. Well, you're going to win. You say, well, what about my pride? Yeah, yeah. God gives grace to the humble. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. What does that look like? Standing. Well, it's bracing for a fight, for a struggle. You'll notice all through this passage, the whole point is, is to stand. The whole point is to not move. Fascinating. He's not going to talk about doing something. He's not going to talk about moving. He's going to talk about standing, not moving. So interesting. So much of temptation is to get you to do something. 
instead of just standing still. Standing. We need to stand. Standing is also the opposite of laying down. And I've talked to a lot of people, and they, you, know, you, you get the picture, you get the picture when you're talking to them, man, temptation comes, and they just lay down and st- curl up in the fetal position, make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. That's not standing. That's laying down getting kicked. That's a victim. <laughs> you see, Andy, you're mocking him. Well, you, you know, some people need a little bit of that. You know, they need a little bit of just, that's what you're doing. You're, you're just, ah, make it stop, okay? You need to stand up. Stand. And you need to be strong. Stand. Listen, we're watching, uh, we're watching all the playoff games with my family and my kids. Uh, we're, we're a little bleary-eyed some days. Um, the kids, I don't know why they're all sick, but we're watching the hockey games. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed with the playoff games, one of the things I've noticed is these guys, you know, skate down, you know, a zillion miles an hour, down the ice, you know, trying to get the puck, and boom, right in the boards. You know, they just boom, right in the boards, Right? And, and you're like, Whoa. and you see him get knocked down. And then, and then like they got superhuman power or something. It's like, bing, they're back up. How'd that happen? You know, like if I got hit, like I, I, I looked at one of them. If I got hit like that, I wouldn't get up for a week. I, I would still, yeah, they'd have to cart me off. And the guy, the guy's like, Poof, bing, you know, like this. Well, he's not laying down. And he knows, he knows. I go after that puck. There's going to be a guy named with a number 76 on his shirt that's gonna come, you know? Like, you gotta look for it coming. And you see it, man, they're like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, stay standing. But they're bracing, they're bracing for it. They're bracing for the fight. And that's what he's talking about here. He's like, listen, stand. I, I, I got some sad news for you. Listen, the temptation is never going to go away. Andy, you mean to tell me you're a pastor and sometimes you get tempted? Yeah. It never goes away. You know your crazy story? A few years ago, I was hanging out at Jericho, Lisger. Glorious time with the guys. Oh, feeling the Holy Spirit, love in the room, peace in the room, joy in the room. Oh, man, God is doing amazing things. This is wonderful. Man, I gotta go home. All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow. You know, I'm, I'm taking off, heading down the street. I got two blocks away, two blocks away. Still, I mean, praying, just thanking the Lord, walking down the street, just thanking the Lord. Probably praying in tongues, you know, just thanking the Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus. And I see this dude walking up towards me on the same side of the street, same street. I look at walking up towards me. I'm just, oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, you're good, you're good. And I just had this overwhelming sensation, this thought, this feeling. If I hit that guy in the face, he's gonna fall right down. I should do it. I, I, he'll never see it coming. Boom! I I could just, I could just drop him right here on the sidewalk. What's the point? Listen, the temptation never goes away. Like, man, my pastor is evil. No, it's not from me. That temptation did not come from me. And I sent it right back where it came from. Because <laughs> it wasn't from me. It was from hell. And I recognized it. I was like, what, what is that? What, like, I'm really going to do that. <laughs> you understand? Temptation never goes away. What do you need to do? You need to be strong in the Lord. You need to brace for the fight. You need to put on the armor of God. It's not going away. It's not going away. Listen, that temptation is not going away. Metaphysical phenomenon is not going to disappear overnight. It's going to keep happening. Why is that? Because we have an enemy and we're in a fight. You need to be strong. You need to be strong in the Lord. You need to take courage from Him. He keeps writing, verse 12, he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. 
This is important to realize. Your fight is not with your neighbor. It's not with your spouse. It's not with your ex. It's not your kids. It's not your parents. It's not the government. It's not the system. It's not your employer. It's not, it, it's not human. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That frees me up to just love people. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Listen, it's these spiritual forces that are going to try to get us to move, to do things based on their instruction or their command or their intimidation or their bullying or their shame or their guilt or their lie or their deception or their doubt. Trying to get you to go based on what they want you to do. No, 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 let's make sure we are engaging the real enemy and not getting distracted with people. Paul encourages us, listen, there's no reason to take the bait of resentment or a grudge. Your fight's not with them. We need to recognize who our real enemy is. We need to be strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is the second time I've referenced 2 Corinthians. It's a fantastic book. Chapter 10, Paul writes in verse 3, same topic, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We don't have to fight people. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. What's he saying? He's saying that to recognize that the real fight, the real battle is in the mind. It's with the thoughts. And it's not just changing the way that we think. It's not just changing the way that we think. If that worked, We'd only need one book of chapters, not a bunch of books with updates. We don't need those. We could read one book and be done with drugs, be done with lust, be done with gluttony. Not knowing what to do, that's only part of the problem is knowing what to do. Part of the problem is knowing what to do. What we need is divine power. We need divine power. We need the ability to do these things. I know I'm supposed to say no to chocolate covered almonds. I need the power to say no to chocolate-covered almonds. Do you understand? So this has divine power. These weapons have divine power. I have, uh, some of you guys, I've, I've encouraged you with this, but uh, it's good for the whole church. I, I've just finished listening to an eight-week series that Pastor Brian Broderson of Calvary Chapel down in Costa Mesa, California, did on spiritual warfare. Uh, Brian actually came to Calvary here uh, in Ottawa about four or five years ago, and uh, some of you may remember him, but he, he does, out of everything I have ever heard ever on the topic, this is by far beyond the best I've ever heard. I wish every Christian could hear that series, even just one message. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, post, I'll post the first message on uh, Twitter, Facebook, that stuff, uh, after the Bible study tonight. But it's an eight-week series, and he'll go further in depth in this topic of engaging in spiritual warfare, what this looks like. I want to help people. I want to see people get help. Verse 13, back in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. What's the belt of truth? You ever seen the guys lifting weights in the gym, and they got that leather belt, and it goes in the back like this, and it's big and wide, and it goes in the middle like this? Or sometimes you see it at the construction sites. They don't have the leather one with the buckle. They got the Velcro one and a fanny pack off the side. No, it's a joke. But sometimes they have the, well, what is it there to do? Well, it's there to just hold your core together so that you can lift things that you can't lift without it. It makes you stronger than you naturally are. It's the belt of truth. Now, it's not the belt of feelings. It's not the belt of feelings. 
You say, Andy, what do you mean? Well, a lot of us, we, we're, we, we put our faith in our feelings because our feelings are so strong. They're very strong, but they're fickle. They're very fickle. I'll give you an example. I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. The whole world's gonna end. This is terrible. I just wanna crawl in my bed and go home. And then the sun comes out. Oh, I feel better. I don't feel that way anymore. <laughs> the sun's out. It's not dreary anymore. Yeah, anybody else like that? So, well, what just happened? Well, my feelings changed. Well, why did your feelings change? Well, because the facts on the ground changed. What, what changed? Well, the sun came out. That made me feel better. So why would you put your faith in your feelings? You, you should put your faith in the facts. Because your feelings will change based on the facts that you fed them. I'll give you another illustration. I'm never gonna get married. Nobody loves me. Nobody loves me like that. I think I'll just go eat. <laughs> and then the phone goes off, ding. And it's some person from high school. Oh la la. I feel loved, I feel love. Oh, there's hope. What happened, your feelings changed? No, 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 the facts just changed. <laughs> the facts just changed. You understand? You gotta put your faith in the facts, in the truth. You need to surround yourself with the truth. Truth is not something that you already have. Truth is something that you have to apply to yourself. Truth is something that you have to do something with every day. And it makes you stronger. Faith in the truth. If you put your faith in the facts, your feelings will follow. They will follow. Put your faith in the truth. He says, first thing you want to do, put on the belt of truth. Wrap that thing around you. Gird up your loins. Yeah. With the belt of truth. That was for the men. The Facebook one was for the girls. And then he says, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does the breastplate do? Well, it covers the heart. Protects the heart. Protects the lungs. And what is that? Well, it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Listen, the first thing you need to realize, the first bit of truth that you got to get drilled into your heart, into your head, is having to do with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's that recognizing that Jesus Christ came, lived a perfect, sinless life, and died on the cross, not because he did something wrong. He died on the cross for you and for me. And he offered his life to you and to me in an exchange so that he would take on all of my sin, my past sin, my present sin, my future sin, he would take it all upon himself and I would receive all of his righteousness. This means the second after I'm done sinning, I can pray right there in that moment and God will hear my prayer, not because of my own actions, but because of the action of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the breastplate of righteousness. That's what that looks like. And that's the first thing you need to know. We relate to God based on grace. We don't relate to God based on our behavior. Listen, you're always going to feel crummy after you sin. But if you'll put your faith in the facts, Jesus Christ paid the price for my sin on the cross. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Put your faith in the facts and the feelings will follow. Amen? That's good preaching. Then he says, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. There's a bunch of ways you can go with this. This is the one I think that is good. It says, I think, to, is this I think is recognize, realize, and commit. All of my steps 
are in the service of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? I am no longer living for myself. I am now living for Jesus Christ. Where I'm going today is not for me. Where I'm going today is for Jesus Christ. I've given my life to him. His priorities have now become higher than my own priorities. I've given my life to Christ. My feet have been fitted with the gospel, the readiness of the gospel of peace. Jesus wants peace. He doesn't want to fight. Verse 16, he says, in all circumstances, all circumstances, take up the shield of faith and with, with which you can extinguish all, 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 all the flaming darts of the evil one. There is no substitute for the shield of faith. Zero. There's no substitute for it. You have to put your faith in the truth. And it's your faith that is tested every time a flaming dart comes your way. It's your faith that's tested. Is God really good? Does God really have your best interest at heart? Will God do right by you? That's the flaming dart of the enemy. Did you really get saved? Are you really going to heaven? Is it really all worth it? I mean, all that stuff is all the flaming darts of the enemy, and it's faith, and you're not gonna feel like it. You won't feel like it. When do you think that flaming dart's gonna come? Right before you sin and right after you sin. <laughs> That's when you need the shield of faith. Faith that I've been born again. Faith that my sins are forgiven. Faith in who I am as a Christian. Faith that the truth is true. Even faith that the truth is true. Then he says, take the helmet of salvation. Protects your brain. Keeps me thinking clearly. Sober, wise, applying the truth of the salvation to my thinking. And then he goes on offense. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you remember, this is how Jesus defeated Satan in his temptation. Every single time was with the Word of God, it was with the Scripture. It's how he answered questions, it's how he taught, it's how he explained things. He did it through the lens of the Word of God, the truth. And it's offense. Let me tell you what that looks like practically. Let's say you fall into temptation. Now, number one, you don't want to give the devil one minute bonus time in shame. You want to be like that hockey player that comes right up off the guys. Poof. Where's the puck? <laughs> you might have knocked me down, but where's the puck? You don't want to give him another minute of shame. And you're going to have to, you're going to have to train yourself to do that. Little kids that are hockey players, they don't do that at the beginning. They have to be trained to do that. They have to be trained to ignore the pain, jump up, get back in the game. So here's what it looks like, sort of the spirit. So number one, you don't want to give them a minute of shame. You want to get right back into it, confess your sin, right back with Jesus Christ. Hey, we're good to go. And then, this is great. If somebody hits you, somebody hits you and black, gives you a black eye, Man, the best way to end that fight is to smash his face. I mean, it's just the best way. It's just to hit him and keep hitting, just until he's not moving anymore. I mean, that's how fights go. That's, that's how they go. Otherwise, if you allow them to keep hitting you, it's a problem. I got in a fight once. I've been in a couple fights, actually. Uh, they just didn't give me their lunch money when I wanted it. No, it's a joke. Um, no, actually, all the fights I got into went the other way around. Um, but it, the only way the fight stops is, is if, you know, they stop. <laughs> so you can help them stop. And uh, so, Andy, what are you saying? Here's what I'm saying. Take the word of God and use it. Share it. What do you mean? Well, you just commit. If I fall for chocolate-covered almonds again, the next time that happens, if it happens, the next time it happens, I'm going to share the gospel with 10 people. Bring it. I might get knocked down, but you're going down. Do you understand? That's a fight. Now you're in a fight. And now you're taking the weapons of our warfare, which is what? Spiritual. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to spread it around. Some of you guys are thinking, you're like, I'd be sharing the gospel an awful lot. <laughs> Amen. 
Amen. Hey, and listen, sometimes some of the things that we're going through is because you're sharing the gospel a lot. And you don't want to stop. Don't stop doing that. Keep at it. Keep at it. We're in a fight. We're in a war. Hit them back. Do it repeatedly. <laughs> Just Listen, you come over here and you cause me to sin, I'm taking 10 hostages. That's the way it's going to go down. Well, who's going to stop you from sharing the gospel? Nobody's going to stop you. In Canada, nobody's going to stop you. Nobody's going to stop you. We're free to share the gospel here. Lastly, Paul says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. I'm going to go back to this point. Listen, some of you guys are thinking, I'll never do that. I will never do that. I'll never do that. I'll never do that. Listen, you need to hear something. Either you're going to love your sin or you're going to love Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Either you're going to continue being a slave to sin or you're going to become a slave of righteousness and a slave of Jesus Christ. Make a choice. Jesus made his very clearly. He says here, he says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. This seems to be the point of all of the armor. The point of all of the armor seems to be, the point of all the struggle, all the wrestling, all the preparation, the point of the shield of faith is so you can continue praying. Nothing would get in the way of you praying. It's fascinating. Another way this looks practically, I shared this with some guys here recently. I talked about falling to temptation, a way to go back at it. I'll talk about how to respond to temptation. Instead of just being inundated with temptation, I gotta survive, I gotta survive, I gotta survive. Here's one of the suggestions I received and I thought it was great, I'm gonna go back to it. When I get tempted for chocolate covered almonds, I'm going to pray for this specific prayer request. This person to come to know Christ, this miracle in somebody's body that needs to happen, you know, this, this, I'm gonna attach it to that. So when you tempt me, I'm gonna pray for this specific thing. One of two things is gonna happen. I'm gonna have to find a new prayer request because that one got answered, or the temptations are gonna be less frequent. Because it's a losing proposition. Why? Because I'm fighting. You understand? I'm fighting. Some of the girls are like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to fight. Listen. I'm leaving that alone. I'm just going to leave it alone. Leaving it alone. Move on. (laughs) Be strong. (laughs) Let us use our strength for our people and for the cities of our God and may the Lord do what seems good to him. You know what happens when you read the rest of that chapter, 1 Chronicles? You find out that the Lord gave Joab and Abishai a huge victory that day. And it's the same thing the Lord will do for you. He'll give you a victory. Not because you earned it, not because you deserve it, not because you're strong enough for it, but because he's a good God. And he's looking for somebody that is willing to believe, to have faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he has done for others, he will do for you. You gotta take him at his word. You gotta have faith. You need to be strong in the Lord. Listen, some of you here tonight, though, you're not a Christian. You've never come to that place where you have bowed your knee and surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You need to know something. You are a pawn of our enemy, of Satan. You're a pawn. You're being bullied, you're being intimidated, you have guilt, you have shame, and there is no hope for you to get over some of the things that you're struggling with in your life. There's no hope for you. 
Oh, you may get victory over the chocolate-covered almonds, but the chocolate-covered raisins are coming your way. You're always going to live a life where somebody else is telling you what to do and when to do it. You're going to be a victim. You can simplify the whole spiritual warfare down into two statements. It's in, it's in James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But you can't resist the devil unless you've submitted to God. A few years ago, uh, they called me from the office and they said, Andy, we've got a little problem. The offering totaled up to $666. What do we do? I said, deposit it, man. Thank Jesus for it. It's good. Greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. We're not going to get moved by that kind of stuff. We're not going to get freaked out by that kind of stuff. Why? God is with us. We're operating with God under grace. Man, we've got him in our corner, and Jesus Christ is the proof. Why would we get intimidated by that? Around that same time, I came to the office one day, and right there in the middle of the laneway was a bird that had been cut open and laid out flat, and there were some beads around it, and there was some weird stuff around it, and you could tell somebody had sacrificed that thing and done some sort of chant over it, right there in the laneway at the Bible house. <laughs> say, Andy, what'd you do? I scooped it up, put it in the trash. Listen, greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. These things are true. They're true. We've got to put our faith in the truth. Otherwise, we're not going to continue in the ministry. Otherwise, we're not going to continue in marriage. Otherwise, we're not going to continue in holiness. Otherwise, we're not going to continue in godliness. Otherwise, you're never going to get free of sin in order to be any kind of good in this world. You've got to put your faith in the truth. You've got to submit your life to Jesus Christ. You need to bow your knee to him. I am pleading with you. Pleading with you. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Don't give Satan any more days of being his pawn, being his victim. Give your life to Jesus Christ. How do you do that? Andy, you, you pray. You say, Father, forgive me of my sin. Receive me as your child. Because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for me. And give me the grace, give me the strength to live for you the rest of my life. That's what you do. And God will hear your prayer and he'll save you. And you might even feel different. And I am your creation. Created to serve, created to worship you. Just keeps on throbbing With your passion inside me And I stand in the other life You've given me Oh, on my feet they They keep on dancing With the rhythm you've placed in me And I stand in the other Rises in